Hi, I'm Cullen, and welcome to HTML5 Application Development Fundamentals. Let's go ahead and get started with Module 1, the Application Lifecycle. Do a quick review of our agenda here to get started. Um, we're going to cover four different objectives today. 1.1, understand the platform fundamentals, and in discussing that, we'll review the steps of app building, um, talk about the runtime environment as well. Um, 1.2, manage the state of an application. We'll manage, talk about managing app data. Super important if you're building an application. Um, 1.3, debug and test an HTML5-based touch-enabled application. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, fixing problems that might occur in your code with debugging and testing, and then talk about validating your code before we move on to objective 1.4, where we talk about publishing an application to a store. So um, a couple of quick things that I just want to go ahead and let you guys know before we jump into this, is that that this is a very big cursory overview of everything that we're going to be doing. And so all of our next modules are going to teach you how to go ahead and perform a lot of the, the steps that we talk about today. But definitely do come back and revisit this particular uh, presentation at the end, after you've gone through and you've learned how to develop apps with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and, and review these steps again. Really important, okay? All right, let's get started. All right, so there are, are nine basic steps for building an app, right? And I'm sure that you could add a couple in here and there, um, but, but these are some really, really good things to keep in mind when, when going through the app building process. Um, first, you want to plan your project, right? Um, then you have to design your user interface. And the user interface, just so you know, is what you see on the screen when you visit a website or when you use a, an application. It's everything that you can possibly interact with. Um, you want to update the app manifest, right? And a manifest file typically includes permissions for an app in order to be able to access, uh, you know, different hardware functions on a device um, or even access other applications. Next, we get started with actually writing our code. So that's our HTML, our CSS, and then also our JavaScript. And then we move on to, to actually building the app. So taking all that code and organizing it in order to, to create something that's functional and useful for people. Um, we test, 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 and debug. We want to find any errors in our code um, before we publish our app. Um, and, and when I say publish, another word that you're going to hear commonly for publishing is packaging. Right? You package the application um, in order to put it into an executable file and make sure that, that people can actually download it, run it, and, uh, and start using it. Pretty cool stuff, right? Uh, we also want to validate to make sure that everything in that, that uh, packaging process went correctly um, and that, that things are going to operate the way that they're supposed to. Finally, we deploy. Deploying is the best part because that's when you take your baby that you just created and you send it off into the wild so that people can use it and, and put your app and all your hard work to good use. Okay? All right. Um, next, let's talk about the runtime environment, right? So when you build an application, it runs, it executes. Um, Windows has a, a specific version of a runtime environment. All right. um, the runtime environment is, is where users run the app and also where you're going to do a lot of testing. In, in Windows, it's called the Windows Runtime Environment, or WinRT. Um, all right. Um, let's talk a little bit more about Windows Runtime. Um, it, it provides developers with access, you know, developers being you, uh, with, with access to user's device and also its operating system. So you have access to hardware components like a camera or a GPS system, and you also have uh, access to, to different services that are provided by the operating system. And, and it does this through the WinRT and Windows library for JavaScript APIs, right? Um, go back, and I, I just want to focus on this visual real quickly. Here we're going to talk about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And you're going to use JavaScript to be able to access these WinRT APIs, which will, will let you access um, communication and data services, um, graphics and media, and then devices, um, you know, cameras, and, and also printing services, things of that nature. So keep that all in mind, OK? Um, an API is an application programming interface. And it's, it's essentially a set of guidelines that, that 
allow a program to communicate with another. And so um, you know, you're going to go and you're going to write a lot of code in developing your application. And fortunately, some other really great folks have, have already built a lot of different uh, code um, that you can reuse in order to, to perform the functions that you want to with your application. Um, when a web app executes, it actually does so inside of a contained environment. And, and this contained environment is called an app container. Right. It's a, a separate memory space, and the reason why we want to want to execute our application, uh, rather the reason why um, a runtime environment is built this way, is is we want to prevent our apps from corrupting the operating system. There would be nothing worse than than booting up your computer and then running an app, and then all of a sudden you you find out that that app has corrupted your system, and you have to just restore your entire operating system. That would be awful, and and your app definitely would not receive very good reviews on the App Store if uh, if you ruin somebody's computer. So keep that in mind. Uh, be very appreciative of the architecture that's used to create the runtime environment. Okay. Um, next, I want to just briefly touch on the .NET framework. Okay. Um, the .NET framework is also a component of, of building Microsoft applications or building web applications, um, and it provides a secure environment for web apps to run, right? And security is a huge, huge component. Um, the, the key to take away from this particular slide is that, that when you're building apps, you have to be mindful of, of permission sets uh, because you're going to use them to define what application code has access to and the ability to do. So once again, accessing different services, um, accessing different applications, and also being able to access hardware. Um, the .NET framework is, is what makes this possible. All right, uh, another huge like an exceptionally, exceptionally key component in developing applications is managing data. Um, we are creating data every second of every day. If you have a smartphone on you right now, you're actually creating data, right? Um, unfortunately, mine's in my bag. Otherwise, I'd show it to you. But it doesn't take very much, right? Um, when we access a web page, that's where it all starts, right? Accessing a web page or using a web app. Um, we, we commonly enter in um, URLs into an address bar of, of a browser like www.sample.com. And, and when this happens, our browser sends an HTTP request to a web server. That web server then sends back um, uh, you know, all the data that we need in order to create a web page, or in order for our browser to render a web page. Um, HTTP is short for hypertext, <clears throat> hypertext Transfer Protocol. It's a stateless protocol, which means that it doesn't retain data from session to session. So when you go on to a website and you use um, that HTTP protocol, no data is going to be remembered. Um, there are different uh, different uh, methods for, for making sure that, that we remember and recall user data when using applications and, and web pages, okay? Um, and we'll actually go ahead and detail them here in just a second. But uh, a big key takeaway here is when we close a web browser, after using an application, data is not automatically saved. So when a user or when a user like yourself requests access to an application or, or just simply use a web browser, um, you create a state. And there, there are three different states there. There are session states, application states, and then persistent states. Um, state management is the process of, of maintaining information that you, or data that you receive or, or give or provide when using web pages and web apps. Okay? A session state is created when access to an application is requested by logging in. So if you log into an app, um, you are starting a session, okay? And, and session state information um, will persist until you end the session or you log out of an app. In contrast, an application state it is simply created when a browser sends a request for a web page to a web server, and then it ends when you close a browser, right? So um, if you open up Internet Explorer, then, then you create an application state, and then you perhaps log into a, an application like Facebook, you create a session state. You log out of Facebook, you close the session state and it ends, and then if you close out of the browser window, you close the application state. 
Um, persistent state information is a little bit different from both of these, these other states that we just talked about. It's, um, it's data that remains for use for, by an application long after a session ends or even after you close an application, right? It, it allows an app to continue uh, its state when a user returns to the site. So like if you're playing a, a game online or something along those lines, and you return, you log back in, and you're able to pull up all your information so you continue on the same level, something like that. Um, for a long time, and still today, we, we use cookies to work around the fact that HTTP doesn't retain data from, from session to session. All right? uh, cookies are just small files that save information about users that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, cookies are just small files that save information about users. So like we talked about the video game example, um, a cookie might be stored on, on your local machine, or rather, a cookie might be stored uh, or might be used in order to access information about which level you are on. I apologize for misspeaking there. Um, you have to pull cookies from web servers, right? So when you're using uh, an application um, and, and you log out, your browser is going to send that cookie back to a web server. Um, and then that file, of course, is used to identify you and, and customize your experience. And so next time you log back into an application, you're actually, your browser is going to request that cookie from the server. A um, little bit cumbersome, and it, it can possibly cause a couple of problems, too. Okay? We'll, we'll talk about that during one of our later modules. Um, actually, no, you know what? Let's talk about it right now. Limitations of cookies, all right? Um, the use of cookies can present a number of problems. We've got different security risks that are posed to us. We've got some security risks right here. If you pretend that this is a cookie, that's actually an icon for a script file, but we'll call it a cookie right now, okay? Um, and also, performance can decrease for your web app due to the amount of data that's sent back and forth between computers because every time... Um, Every time your, your user experience is going to be customized, uh, we have to retrieve that cookie from the web server. Um, with HTML5, we start to correct some of these issues, and, and we can actually use web storage instead. Okay? And there are two different types of web storage. There's local storage, and then there's session storage. Local storage is going to let, let users of your app save larger amounts of, of persistent data. So persistent data would be just application data that, that lasts for an extended period of time. Session storage, on the other hand, is going to let users save session data on the local device, and it's only going to last the duration of a session. Um, both methods allow users to store tons of data. It doesn't slow down a connection between you and a server because data is transferred only when requested, and we don't have to do it like we do with cookies because everything is stored locally on a person's device. Um, we can also use app cache for offline files. So if you want to design an application that people can use off, offline, uh, we're going to go ahead and implement app cache. And we'll show you how to do that a little bit later. Um, we, can, we actually have the power to dictate which type of information or which type of files are stored locally uh, offline on a user's computer in something called a cache manifest file. Um, all you need to know about a cache manifest file right now is just simply that, but I do definitely suggest that you, you do a quick Bing search for the application development process for web apps. Um, go to the, the Microsoft Developer Network webpage and, and do a quick search, and you're going to find a lot of really good information out there about this whole process and, and how to store files files locally on users' machines in order to enhance their experience, okay? Definitely make sure you take time to do that. All right, so we got a, just a couple of last, last topics here. Um, debugging and testing, okay? Um, debugging and testing are perhaps the most important steps in developing high-quality web applications because they, they ensure that your app comes out error-free. Debugging is just the process of detecting, finding, and correcting errors in logic and syntax. Um, logic. Logic errors, they prevent the app from behaving as expected. And so sometimes you're going to make mistakes in your code that might lead to, to you know, poor user experience. And so you're going to have to go ahead and correct those things. Or maybe different elements on the page might not uh, act the way that you anticipate them to do. And that might be an issue with the code that you're creating. Okay? Um, logic is, is just something that is, is mental. 
it's not something that you, you necessarily see. So it's the way that you're thinking about an issue um, versus the actual code itself. Um, the actual code itself, if you have any problems there, they're known as syntax errors. Um, syntax errors are just simple typos in code which prevent your apps from running. So it might be like a missing semicolon or something along those lines. Um, and you'll notice some of the errors that you could possibly make when you start experimenting and using HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. Okay, So keep those things in mind. All right, after you, you've debugged and tested your code, you wanna make sure that you validate it as well. This is another exceptionally important step. You can head to um, a markup validation service that's provided by W3C in, in order to validate your code. Um, all that you're doing is making sure that your code is properly interpreted by browsers, right? So if, if you're designing your code so that it can be platform independent, so that it can use across a variety of browsers, then you have to make sure that it's validated. And from that, you'll learn um, whether you need to make any changes in order to, to adjust um, inaccuracies in code or, or correct syntax errors. So keep those things in mind. All right, um, packaging apps. This is our, our last little bit here, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so packaging an app is simply the process of preparing it for installation on devices or different systems. Okay? Um, if you want to package and publish an app in the Windows Store, you can use the Windows App Certification Kit. Um, all that that does is provide a report describing any problems with an app, so it's sort of another validation step. And if there are problems, you clearly can go ahead and correct them and then resubmit your app um, through the, the Windows App Certification Kit and, and make sure that everything's working properly. Okay? All right, now this is the last step, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so publishing an app. So you've gone through all this hard work of creating and developing an application. Um, you've got to know how to publish it and where to go. There are just some really, really simple steps if you want to publish it to, to a marketplace for apps. Um, for example, the Windows Store. Um, before publishing an app to the Windows Store, you must sign up and pay for a developer account. Paying is always kind of a bummer, but just remember how much money you can make when people download your apps. Two, you've got to go through the app submission checklist to make sure that you've, you've dotted all I's and crossed all T's. Three, you've got to capture some screenshots of unique features in your app, different things that, that you want people to take notice of. Four, you have other users test your app on multiple devices and platforms, exceptionally important. And finally, five, a little bit of paperwork, you've got to include a privacy statement if your app gathers personal information or uses copywritten software, okay? So, Definitely go to the Windows Store, take a look at these things, do a quick Bing search. There's a lot of information here and a whole lot more to learn, okay? Um, I'm really excited that you're here to, to learn about how to develop HTML5 apps. It's an, just a, a remarkable journey that I've been able to take in learning how to develop and how to code, and, and I hope that you really, really enjoy it, all right? Just a quick summary of everything that we've learned here today. Um, talked about how to build an app, talked about the, the runtime environment, managing app data, and then uh, debugging and testing, validating code, and also publishing to an app store. Thanks for joining me. Once again, I'm Cullen. Um, see you again on Module 2.